Chapter Three. Night made the air of the World's Edge Mountains even more bitter. Though not as bone-jarringly cold as it was in winter, the passes were still harsh at the end of summer, and the rock underfoot was shrouded in a cloak of frost. Bloch, Kraus, Drassler, and the senior officers sat around a rough oak table high up in the tower of the last wayford before Blackfire Cape. Most of the army were sleeping below them, either rammed up against one another in the hard stone halls of the fort, or shivering in the tents clustered around the gates. The huge fires they'd built to ward off the cold burned still, denting the worst of the chill. Bloch had ordered that they be kept stoked, even though it would give away their presence in the mountains for miles around. They hadn't come to creep around like thieves, though. At dawn, they would march again. They knew where the enemy was, and thanks to the scouts of Drassler, they knew the rough strength of the forces that remained to them. The back of the Orc army had been broken by Schwarzhelm on the plains of Averland, but enough Greenskins had survived to make the keep a difficult target. Bloch had two thousand men under his command, including the remnants of the Mountain Guard which had survived the first days of the incursion. Drassler reckoned a similar number of Orcs had made it back to the Cape. But they had the advantage of stone to hide behind. We'll need to draw them into the open," Block said, looking over the plans of attack his men had been discussing. If they stay behind those walls, we're never gonna get them out. Why would they come out?" asked Drassler. "They got supplies and they got protection." Kraus grinned. "They'll come out," he said. "Give an orc a reason to fight, and he will take it." Drassler shook his head. Not these ones. They had a plan, and they stuck to it, just like the ones on the plains. Mused Bloch, remembering the artful way Grunwald had been drawn further and further east. It's like I said, insisted Drassler. They've been armed by men and given their orders by men. Bloch had heard this thing said many times since leaving Grenstadt. He didn't want to believe it, but the evidence was there. The orcs were wearing close-fitting armor and carried straight swords. They hadn't attempted a wild rampage through the east of the province, but had acted as if explicitly commanded to draw Schwarzhelm from the city. And then there were the coins. An orc had little use for gold, but there was plenty of it on their corpses. They'd made the shillings into earrings and pendants. Or stuff them down the throats of their victims for fun. Someone in the Empire had planned all of this. Tell me again," he said to Drassler, his chin leaning heavily on his crossed fingers. "How did you let them get at you?" Drassler looked irritated. No one liked to account the story of their failure. "What more do you want?" he asked. "We got our orders just as we always did. Captain Neumann did as he was told." We were told there were four bands of greenskins coming over the passes, none of them more than a hundred strong. The orders from the Averberg were to destroy them before they defiled the memorial sites. Block knew all of this. He knew that the roving bands of orcs had turned out to be made up of thousands, not hundreds. That they'd been working in concert, and once the defenders had emerged from the walls, they'd been slaughtered. The memory of those killing grounds was still vivid in his mind. And who gave you those orders? He asked, still searching for some clue. Schwarzelm had told him that one of the contenders for the electorship, Rufus Leidorf, had been a traitor. If he was the one orchestrating all of this, then he deserved everything that a big man had no doubt dished up on him in Averheim. They came as they always did, a courier from Averheim, dressed in the livery of the Citadel, carrying the scrolls in a locked casket. He had a guard of warriors, two dozen, all wearing the colors of the Averberg garrison. Everything was in order, signed away by the steward. I saw them myself. Nothing was different. And you didn't think anything was strange? Asked Bloch, trying to keep the incredulity from his voice. Four incursions, all at once, all moving in different directions. What of the defense of the keep? Drassler stiffened. Fighting is a way of life up here, Commander. We're not like the rest of our kinsmen. When the order comes, we follow it. 
Kraus shook his head. You were played for fools, he muttered. Drassler slammed his fist on the table. How dare you, he hissed. He looked very tired. They all looked very tired. We were doing our duty. Your duty was to defend the cape, said Kraus, and his face showed disdain. Enough, said Bloch, unwilling to see the tension spill over into pointless bickering. He privately shared Krauss's assessment, but nothing could be gained by raking over past failure. This isn't helping. He held his head in his hands, trying to think. There was so much he didn't know. The idea of Averlanders deliberately sabotaging their own defenses was disgusting enough, but maybe the rot went even deeper. The money, after all, had come from Altdorf. Maybe they were still being played for fools. Maybe all of this had been anticipated. That, though, didn't alter the bare facts. He had been ordered to retake the cape. He had a mixed army of Averlanders and Reichlanders, most of them seasoned by weeks of constant fighting, no siege engines, and very little artillery. There had been no news from Averheim since Schwarzhelm's departure from the city, and the supply lines were extended and precarious. A cautious commander might have withdrawn, pulled back to Grenstadt until the situation in the province had become clear, and reinforcements were received. The failure of Grunwald weighed heavily on the mind of Bloch. There was no sense in fighting a battle that could not be won. We have a few hours until dawn, he said. He looked at the officers one by one, gauging from their responses how ready they were for a fight. They all met his gaze. We'll stay awake until we hammer out a plan to get the keep back and the pass secure. His eyes rested on Dressler, who stared back at him defiantly. Despite everything, the mountain guard were keen to avenge their defeat. I want ideas, he growled, feeling impatient for action again. We need to get them out of the keep. One way or another, when the sun goes down tomorrow, we'll have paid those bastards back twice what they handed out to us. I don't care how we do it, but the passes will be back in our hands, and the last of those scum choking on their own traitor's gold. The Grand Fiogonist Volkmar was an imposing sight, even when bereft of his immense battle armor. His armor was thick and leathery, tanned tight by a lifetime on the battlefield. Dark, direct eyes peered out from under feathered eyebrows. Just like Schwarzhelm, he was not known for his humor. His mouth rarely smiled beneath its drooping Kislevite mustache, and his burly arms remained crossed across his chest when not kept busy swinging a warhammer. His shaven head and forearm tattoos completed the savage picture. He looked properly terrifying, as if he struggled himself to contain raging forces of anarchy within him. Even when at rest, he did inspire trepidation. When unleashed on the battlefield, that trepidation turned to awe. Those that knew him well had even more reason to be fearful. This was a man who had come back from the dead, who'd passed beyond the barrier between the mortal world and that of chaos. The pain of it still marked his every word, scored by every movement. No one knew the terror of the great enemy quite as intimately as Volkmar and the experience had marked him out even more than he had been before. With every gesture, every glance, he gave it away. Under the sky of savage piety, a cold furnace of frenzy forever lurked, waiting for the kindling. Once upon a time, he had been a warrior. Now he was a weapon. The head of the cult of Sigmar bowed to very few men, but he did towards the figure before him now. His ochre robes felt across the broad shoulders as he stooped, his right hand nearly touching the floor. Enough of that, came a familiar voice. Sit, we need to talk. The Emperor Karl Franz sat in the same chair he'd used when commissioning Schwarzelm for the Averland mission. Back then, he'd looked at ease with the world, confident and self-assured. Now his skin had taken a pale sheen, and his eyes were ringed with grey. His hair, normally glossy, looked dull. The most powerful mortal man in the old world was troubled, and he wasn't trying to hide the fact. 
Volkmar rose to his full height, grunting as he did so. The wounds which had ravished his body during his escape from the demon Belakor had been slow to close. He sat beside the emperor, saying nothing. The two men were alone. The fine furniture around them looked heavy and lumpen. Outside, a fine rain still spat against the glass windows, and the morning light was grey and filthy. In the corner of the room, the old engineer's clock ticked methodically. Karl Franz looked down at some sheets of parchment in his lap. They looked like they'd been read many times over. Why didn't he come here himself? The emperor mused. Um, my liege? asked Volkmar. Schwarzhelm, he could have spoken to me. I was angry, but not beyond reason. Now I lost both of them. Helborg. If the Reichsmarshal would be found, then Volkmar would be the one priest senior to him to interrogate him. Though hardened by the fires of war and the poison of chaos, that was a task he would not relish. Maybe he did try, said Volkmar. What are you saying? That not all your servants are as loyal as he. Karl Franz frowned, displeased by the implication. He looked down at the parchment again. What do you know of this matter? he asked. A little. Averland is now governed by Heinz Mark Grosslick. The son of Lightdorf is a traitor, and Helborg with him. And do you believe it? What they say of Helborg? Volkmar gave a snort of disgust that said all there was to be said. Schwarzelm has erred, agreed the emperor, and he knows it. Whatever forces were ranged against him have achieved what they set out to do. He looked up, and a little of the familiar resolve shone in his eyes. We have been granted a second chance, he said. They made a single slip. You know of Heinrich Lassus? He was the man behind them. He betrayed himself. Schwarzelm has killed him, taken back the sword of Helborg, and no doubt seeks to return it to him. Perhaps he is already on the road. So, how stands Averland? We don't know. All is clouded. The only thing we can be certain of is that the great enemy is active. They use this succession to gain a foothold. Nothing has been purged. The stain remains, and it is growing. Volkmar let the implications of that sink in. Averland had always been the most placid of provinces, the one furthest from the strife that ravaged the rest of the empire. He should have seen this coming. Only in war there was purity. Where there was peace, there was disease. Can Grosslick handle it? The emperor shrugged. Who knows? He doesn't answer my summons. That may be pride, or it may be worse. In any event, our response must be the same. Here it came, the emperor's orders. Volkmar didn't need his fine-grained knowledge of statecraft to know what they would be. I have tried to manage the affairs of Averland by diplomacy. That has failed now. Whether or not Grosslick is a part of this, he cannot be allowed to preside over treachery. It will be rooted out and destroyed. The emperor crumpled the parchment in his fist, and his knuckles went white. You will take my armies, Volkmar. Empty the Reichland if you have to. The gold in the reserves is yours. Take the warrior priests and the holiest devotees of Sigmar. Take magisters from the colleges, war engines and artillery. Take veteran regiments and the corps of knights. This is no routine suppression of a minor rebellion. This is a new war, and it needs a new army. The emperor looked into Volkmar's eyes, and his expression was desolate. Find out what's happening there, he growled, his fists still clenched. Show the traitors no mercy. Crush them, burn them, and grind them into the ground. I would rather see Averland turned into a blasted waste than see it harbor a second front against the enemy. You know what to do. You know it more than anyone else. Can I trust you, Volkmar? Can you succeed where both my generals have failed? Volkmar felt a surge of enthusiasm quicken inside him, tempered with the fear that had never quite left him. Not since the horrors of Middenheim had he commanded men against the enemy. Now he was being asked to ride again. 
to take up arms and show his devotion to Sigmar in the way the warrior god had always intended. He failed against Archaeon. He failed completely. He might do so again just like the others. Yes, my liege, he replied, his thoughts racing. Yes, you can. Deep in the heart of Averheim's exclusive jewelry quarter, the merchants had been quick to replenish their stocks. Averland was a province blessed with mines on its borders, and Averheim sat squarely on the trade routes between Karakangazar and the heart of the empire. There was money in that place too, and every fat merchant who'd made his fortune shunting cattle from the pastures to the slaughterhouse had wives and daughters who needed a draping in lines of pearls and traceries of silver. So the jewelry business had prospered alongside with them. Some of the craftsmen were Averland bred, plucked from the rural heartland and put to work at the forges or with a hammer. Over the centuries, the fame of the jewelry quarter had grown, and artisans from further afield had settled there. Most of them came from Nuln, bringing new devices with them and a penchant for mechanical innovation. But there were also dwarves, drawn as ever by the prospect of making money through the manipulations of the things they loved, steel, iron, gold, and gromril. The stunted folk kept themselves to themselves, shunning the company of their human counterparts unless some deal needed to be struck, or supplies of stone were running low. So it was that they formed a community within a community in Averheim, locked in their own arcane world of contracts and grudges, tolerated by their hosts, but seldomly interfered with. Such isolation did bring certain advantages. The dwarves didn't involve themselves in human affairs, as they were just as happy serving a light door for an Altraum as they would have been serving under Raukov or Toddbringer. Happy, that is, as long as they were not overtaxed and were given free reign to market their creations. That made the dwarf smiths of Averland useful contacts for men of a certain profession. If gold flowed, then they would be more discreet than even a corpse. Of course, getting them to trust anyone but a member of their own clan was difficult. It did take persistence, patience, and the working knowledge of the simpler ways of the Kozalid, plenty of money, and a formidable power of persuasion. Not many humans could boast all of that, but Peter Verstolen could. So it was that the spy sat, knees up almost against his chest, sitting on a three-legged stool in the forge of the master jewelsmith Rosic Valgrind. Before him, the fire glowed angrily, throwing red light across the dark interior. Around the hearth hung metal objects of various kinds. Some were familiar, tongs, clamps, bellows, and fine-headed hammers. Others looked like nothing Verstolen had seen before, and their uses could only be guessed at. The owner of the forge himself worked at the back of the chamber, ignoring Verstolen and tapping away at a ring of Gromril. His gnarled hands worked with astonishing speed and precision, caressing and molding the metal as if it were a child's forelock. His naked arms were like corded leather, wound about with brass wire and latticed with tattoos. He smelled of scorched flesh, hot metal and charred oil, and his beard was wiry and truncated from a thousand singes. He didn't speak, and the only sounds to escape his bearded lips was the occasional grunt of satisfaction as the jewelry gradually took shape under the hammers. The deal he'd made with Verstolen had been just for a place to meet. There'd been no payment for conversation, so he did not provide any. There was a tap on the door leading out of the forge and onto the street. Valgrind kept working, ignoring everything but his art. Verstolen clambered up from the low stool and reached for the latch. Outside, wrapped in a long cloak, stood Tokfell. Verstolen beckoned him inside and closed the door behind him. The afternoon light stung his eyes after the occlusion of the forge. I'm glad you could make it, steward, said Verstolen, pulling up a stool. The two of them sat before the hearth. In the background, Valgrind worked away as if nothing was happening. Is it safe to talk? whispered Tokfell, casting anxious looks in the dwarf's direction. Absolutely, said Verstolen, speaking normally. Maybe the safest place to talk in the entire city. Tokfell nodded. I see less of him every day. 
I suspect my services are no longer of much use to him. But how does he seem to you? His mood changes. Some days I do see the qualities I saw in him when Schwarzelm and I arrived. On others, things are less clear-cut. Tachfel nodded. That's right. That's what the others say. It's harder to get to him. I've not spoken to him for days. He is becoming so erratic. Verstolen felt a qualm of recognition. That's what they said about Schwarzelm, too. Was there something corrupting about the city? He immediately thought of Natasha, the witch was still not to be found. So, what are you saying to me, steward? asked Verstolen. I can't believe you've come here to moan about your master's moods. The hands of Tachfold fidgeted on his knees. By the glow of the hearth, his face looked distorted. Something is wrong here, Herr Verstolen, he said, his voice audibly shaking. I tried to warn you of it before Grosslick's coronation. No one seen Ferenc Alptrom since the battle for the city. No one seen Akendorfer. There were other disappearances as well. Such things are normal when power is shifting, said Verstolen, watching Tachful carefully, looking for any signs of dishonesty. The steward was not a master player of the game, but he could have still been subverted. Tachful looked hurt. I may not have your skill in such matters, he said, but I'm not naive. Do you know how many men have been burned at the stake? Two hundred! And it is not all done in the public. I've seen the lists. That's beyond reason. Are there any trials? Supposedly, Tachful snorted. The witch hunter Heidegger has his talents into everything. He even wants my own aides dragged to the stake. None of us are safe. At the mention of witch hunters, Verstolen had to work to suppress a grunt of contempt. The cult members who taken Leonora had been the Templars of Sigmar. He regarded even the uncorrupted ones as little more than butchers and sadists, and the fact that he was frequently mistaken for one of them was a considerable irritation. Tachfel leaned forwards, his fingers twitching with agitation. Can't you see it? he implored. We have picked the wrong man. Verstolen shook his head. That's impossible. I saw the corruption of Lightdorf myself. Now who's being the naive one, counselor? So much has turned on that, and yet you always say that the great enemy is ever more cunning than it seems. Could you not have been allowed to see what you did? Verstolen froze. Natasha has still not been found, he said. She may still be in the city. Her powers are formidable. And while she is still alive, none of us should feel safe. Tachful let slip a bitter laugh. You're obsessed with Natasha. Can't you see that Grosslick is the enemy? He has duped us all. You've seen that monstrosity he's building in the poor quarter. What sane man builds a tower out of iron? Verstolen didn't reply. The more Tachful spoke, the more anxiety started to crowd around him. He'd been so certain. He convinced everyone of Lightdorf's guilt, even Schwarzhelm. And for that matter, where was Schwarzhelm? Why hadn't there been any word from Altdorf? Why hadn't there been any word of anything outside the province? I won't deny that something is wrong here, he said. But Natasha is the witch, and she was the woman of Lightdorf. We need to find her and her whelp of a husband. What can I do to prove it to you? asked Tachful, sounding miserable. You won't accept the evidence of your eyes. No one will. I feel like I'm the only man left who can see it. I will speak to Grosslick, said Verstolen, placing a reassuring hand on the steward's shoulder. There are some things I'd like cleared up myself. Trust me, if the man has been tainted by anything here, I will be able to tell. I'm not proud, her talkful. If I'm wrong, then I'll be the first to come to you to admit it. And then we can decide what to do next. Talkful didn't look very reassured. He will get stronger the longer we leave it alone. 
And what could we do, even if you were right? Asked Verstolen. Could the two of us overthrow an elector count? We need information, man. Also, the Empire will not leave Averheim alone for long. This thing requires subtlety and outside help. For one moment, Tachfo looked as if he wanted to protest further, but the words never came out, and he looked slumped and fearful. Take heart, steward, said Verstolen, trying to improve both their moods. We have already saved Averheim from certain damnation. What corruption remains will be uncovered in time. Tachfel gave him a piteous look. If you really think that, counselor, he said, then I do not understand your reputation for wisdom. Blackfire Keep dominated the land around it, just as the architects had intended. The pass was under a mile wide at the point where it had been constructed. It had been raised on a hill of granite in the center of the otherwise flat and featureless rock around it. The pinnacle of the fortress commanded long views both to the east and to the west, and in normal times the standards of the Emperor and of Averland rustled proudly from twenty-foot-high flagpoles. The bare rock stretching away from the keep on all sides was not there by accident of nature. After the second battle of Blackfire Pass, an army of men and dwarves had worked for months to clear the land. Piles of stone were leveled in back-breaking labor, and a few clumps of foliage capable of surviving the blinding snows of winter were cut down and burned. Approaching the keep undetected was nigh on impossible, and bitter experience had taught the defenders to remain vigilant at all times. The massive walls rose a hundred feet into the clear sky and were as thick as a man's height. Their stone was black from many sieges leveled against them, and the signs of historical devastation were impossible to remove. For all the blood shed over the wind-scoured stone, it would never be left undefended as long as the Empire stood. Blackfire Pass was beyond just a trading route, more than just a strategic foothold in the mountains. It was a place where the Empire itself had been born. There was never a shortage of volunteers willing to man the ramparts of the Wayforts and the Keep, despite the appalling casualties and the near certainty of attack. Indeed, the mountain guard commanders had to pick their men carefully, rooting out the genuine soldiers from the fanatic and the deranged. The cycle of fighting never ended here. Incursions would be followed by a bitter fight back, which would then be followed by a fresh incursion. The humans would never rid the world of the greenskin scourge, and the orcs would never be allowed to hold the passes. As Block looked up at the distant walls, now daubed with the blood of their last human defenders, he knew he was just the latest to contest the site. Whatever the result of his actions, the game would be played for centuries to come even after he was gone. Somehow he found that thought reassuring. All he'd ever known was war. The idea of a world where that didn't exist anymore felt just as wrong as being bought a drink by a dwarf. Both of them were feasibly possible, but you didn't expect to see them in your lifetime. Now he stood with his troops half a mile west of the fortress, in view of the ramparts but far enough away to be untroubled by them. At his side, as ever, were Drassler and Kraus. Behind them, the army stood silent. They were arrayed for battle, divided into companies, and standing in well-ordered ranks. They'd held together very well. Averland companies still carried their standards proudly, both those which Schwarzhelm had raised in Averheim, and the men of Grenstadt and Heideck who'd been drafted into action. Among them were the Reichlander detachments that had been marched out from Altdorf. They were tougher men, hardened by years of ceaseless combat, proudly wearing the white and grey of the richest imperial province. The tall staves of the halberds glinted in the severe light. At the front was Bloch's own detachment. To a man, they were survivors of Grunwald's army. All of them were Reichlanders, tempered in the fiercest of fighting, as unyielding and hard-bitten as any regular troops in the Emperor's armies. No fear showed in their grizzled faces, just a grim determination to see the campaign through. Many of their comrades lay in the rich earth of the pastures below, and their deaths required vengeance. Bloch looked over the heads of the massed troops to the baggage train at the rear, 
reserve companies were standing ready, as silent as the main body of the army. Teams of horses stamped nervously, steam snorting from their nostrils as they shook their heads against the chill. Behind them were the few artillery pieces he'd been able to commandeer. Not much, and little danger to the keep itself. Finally, there were the men of Drassler's mountain guard. No more than two hundred or so of them remained, the others having been killed or harried into the high peaks by the tide of the greenskins. The survivors looked as hard-edged as Block's own men, their beards ragged and their faces unsmiling. This was their chance of revenge, and maybe for some a measure of atonement. All of them were watching him, waiting for the words of command. As they stood, unmoving, the harsh wind rippled across the army. Block turned away from them, back to the fortress. He couldn't make much from that distance anyway. There was no movement on the plain. The keep rose tall and stark from the stone, a block of solid rock thrust from the core of the earth. Though there was no sign of infestation, he knew that the place was swarming with the greenskins. The orders of Schwarzelm, given so lightly after the rout on the grasslands of Averland, would not be so easily fulfilled now. That mattered not, though. He'd been given them, and he would carry them out. He took a deep breath and turned to Kraus. The face of the captain was as bleak as the granite around him. Give the signal, Blah ordered. Let's do it. 